Hey, 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 and welcome back to the channel, all of you four degree of freedom motion sim platform builders. Oh, listen to the sound of that Mark IV GT40. That sounds ballsy. This is a, a monster of torque, this car, and it's certainly a handful to drive. Now, don't panic, guys. We're going to get into the build tutorial very shortly, but I wanted to um, show the front motors on the rig working because uh, I've set up some new electronics in the four degree of freedom motion simulator platform that has made a massive difference in the way that the motion platform performs. And I need to give you a heads up on this because this is something that uh, you should probably consider for yourself. I'm going to do a short overview of the electronics box uh, after this little bit of a demonstration, watching the rig go through its range of motions here to talk about what I've done and to basically get you thinking about how you may want to approach uh, the motor controller side of things for the four degree of freedom motion sim over what the three degree of freedom motion sim was previously. My apologies for the jittery uh, stuff that's happening in the actual game footage. Not sure what's happening there. That doesn't normally happen. Uh, obviously OBS is not coping. I do have a slightly older computer, slightly older. Uh, GTX 960 card. It's probably just coming down to that. I've got the graphics all running at ultra, so I think just with the old computer and that, that card, it's just not coping very well. Uh, recording as well. The computer's doing a lot of work running all the USBs for all the peripherals and the SIM as well, so yeah, I probably need to update now. So apologies for that, guys. Don't let that distract you from what's actually happening with the motion SIM. This is uh, Fontenay in France. This is one of those uh, tracks from uh, the creator Fat Alfie. If you haven't checked out his tracks, he does great vintage tracks, which work really well with these classic muscle cars. This is Fontenay in uh, Brassy in France. It's a fictional uh, race track built from actual roads in France. I'll include a link in the description to this track. It's it's a lot of fun and. It's got a lot of elevation changes, a lot of dips, cobblestones, a lot of hard cornering. It's 25 kilometers in length. It's a really great track to really uh, run a motion simulator platform on. Uh, this demo doesn't go for very long, guys. I don't even get a full drive in. So once this finishes, guys, we'll have a look at the control box. I'll talk to you about all the changes that have been made in the electronics department for the four degree of freedom motion sim platform. So to bring everybody up to date, and to give you a heads up on the changes for the motor controllers, for the Audrinos, and for basically how the rig has changed in performance overall, and mainly due to the addition of this new motor controller. This is a Sabretooth 2x32. So previous to me investing in the Sabretooth 2x32, the old three degree of freedom motion sim ran on three IBT2s of one Audrino Uno R3. With this new setup, the Sabretooth 2x32 now controls the two front motors. The two IBT2s you see here, one controls the surge motor and one controls the traction loss motor, and they run off their own Audrino Uno R3. Now I'm going to give you a comparison to controllers, okay? Here's an IBT2 controller. Now, admittedly, this doesn't have the heatsink on it. I double heat sink my IBT2s anyway, that's why they look so large, but really guys, that's it as far as the IBT2 goes, as it is a control board. Now look at the difference between this and the Sabretooth. Now the Sabretooth is not a H-bridge, it's two separate controllers for two motors, okay? But you can see there alone guys, just in build quality and size, the two are chalk and cheese. Now not to, um, you know, dish or, or bag the IBT2s, too much because we need to also keep in, um, in context what the differences in price are. An IBT2 can be had for about 12 AUD, 12 Australian dollars. The Sabretooth I had to spend $250 shipped 
to my house. Two hundred and fifty Australian dollars. That is a, a large difference in price between an IBT two and the Sabre two. But let me assure you, it is a massive difference in performance between the IBT twos and the Sabre two. It's actually got me in two minds now about perhaps ditching the uh, two IBT twos on the surge and the traction loss and buying another Sabre two. Though to be fair. These are doing okay on the horizontal motors. You can see there the traction loss works quite well and the surge is working really well with these. I do have to have the PID loop, uh, the uh, main K in the um, PID loop turned up quite high and the pulse width modulation is also turned up quite high for the IBT2s and their axis assignments in SIM tools have to be a lot higher. The Sabre tooth, I can ramp everything down the clarity and the fidelity that the Sabretooth brings as far as data transfer goes is second to none. It craps all over the IBT2s. It's really been a game changer in those front two motors, in the uh, motors that control our pitch, our roll, the heave. There's surge on those motors as well. And um, sway I don't have on those motors. Sway, I've got a little bit of sway actually in the traction loss motor and it works really really well because it enables the car to twist a little bit basically with the with the traction loss you need to um, fiddle with settings and filtering but we're getting off track a bit but anyway getting back to what I was saying this has been a game changer on the front motors just the the, the fidelity and the clarity it brings uh, from the data transfer into the rig is amazing I would highly recommend you guys save some money. It's going to change a little bit um, my budget estimate because this is quite a lot more money. Uh, as I said, 250 Australian dollars. But guys, I believe that it is worth every penny of that money. Okay. Now, you get another bonus with speed and data transfer with this new setup with the 4 degree of freedom. Where uh, with the 3 degree of freedom, we had one Audrino controlling three IBT2s. Now we've got... Uh, one Audrino for two IBT2s and one Audrino for basically, in essence, your two motor controllers in your Sabretooth. So it frees up uh, the work that the Audrinos have to do, and so they operate better as well, only having to run two motors. So that also helps things. So guys, I wanted to give you a quick look at this. It's a bit of a teaser, yes, I know. And don't worry, guys, we will go through uh, an extensive tutorial on how to wire all of this stuff up how to set up the software for this. I'll go into what my SIM tools assignments are, what my SMC3 utilities uh, assignments are. The Sabretooth is its own animal. It's a, it has its own software as well um, that you need to tweak as well before you can start running this with SMC3 utilities. There's some dip switches, some settings and stuff that need to be adjusted on this. Now, credit to um, the guys on xsimulator.net. This is where I, I found the information for the Sabretooth, though it was a little bit vague and I've ended up having to basically go into the Dimension software which you download for the Sabretooth and work a few things out for myself. Um, but the bulk of um, how I've worked out how to use that um, and how to use any of this stuff, guys, has, has come off the xsimulator.net uh, site and um, some other sites and forums around the place as well. So that's a quick overview, guys, of what to expect later in the uh, tutorial series when we come to get everything set up with our power supplies and our, uh, our motor controllers and our Audrino Uno R3s. Okay guys, your digital veneers, extremely important because these are great for marking as well as measuring, right? Well back on the side guys that I did my original mark in at 250, which will be the back of our mid frame, where inevitably I'm going to drill a hole guys to take my wiring through my mid frame. And what I'm gonna do guys, I'm gonna make a measurement because this is gonna become the top of the mid frame. This will be the underside. This is the side that will take our trolley that our uni joint and our front motor mount will end up on the top side of this frame. So I wanna mark the very center of this along its entire length, all right? To do that, set of veneers are gonna be perfect, all right? With the sharp edges like this, we can run these along as a scribe and we can mark right along the center. We're going to do that now. So half of 65 guys is of course 32.5 millimeters. So we're gonna find that on this. So I'll loosen off the lock nut on this. This is how these veneers work. They've got a lock nut 
on the top. I'm going to zero this first, make sure it's zeroed. See how it's saying uh, 0.1 at the mill? Zero that out so you get this accurate. Find your 32.5 on your veneers. There we go, 32.5. Lock that out so it can't move. Now these sharp points, we're going to place one on the edge of our box like this. All right, and we're going to run this all the way along our box. Nice and steady. And there we go, guys. We have marked the center of our mid frame on the top. All right, that's going to save us a lot of time going forward. Now, make sure you look after your digital veneers. Don't have them anywhere near where you're grinding or welding, and that goes for any of your measuring tools, guys. Try and have them free of where your grinding sparks are going, especially your weld splatter, all right? If you get weld splatter and stuff on your metal rulers, you'll get beads and little ball bearings and splatter sticking on your rulers, and you'll end up having to grind it off, and then you'll take your marks off when you do it. These are laser etched, they're not very deep, and you'll lose your marks. So we've got a nice mid mark on our mid frame there now, guys. So where we measured our 250 millimeter mark earlier to drill our hole, where I've marked that, okay, I can now put a square on that. And then where my mid point is, where we've just done our line, I'm gonna cross that. And my hole will go directly in the middle of here. Right, we're going to need a humble punch. Let me get the camera back around there a little bit. You'll need a hammer, guys. Obviously, this is another essential tool in your arsenal for this, and you are going to need a metal punch. Either old school, belt the hell out of this punch, or a spring-loaded punch. They're quite good as well. Guys, it's a hard habit to break with the quack. I still use old school. So where the centre of my uh, mid frame is now and where that 250 millimetre point has been marked and crossed on the centre, I'm going to punch that. Now this is ready to drill with a pilot hole first, okay, before it's finishing size. Let's talk about that now. talk about some tooling guys that we're going to require to get the job done on our four degree freedom motion sim platform i highly recommend you get yourself some metal carbide tipped hole saws okay now this brand here guys that i bought this brand that's named after the doctor uh, i bought this set guys it was only around 59 dollars all right that i got this from machinery house here in australia you can buy these sets on ebay now, the actual hole saws themselves are by a company. They're a Chinese company, okay? They're called TCT. I bought these. I found them individually on eBay. Right, the 25mm hole saw was $10. The 22mm hole saw was like $9.50. They're quite cheap. They are quite a good hole saw. So you'll need, guys, uh, for this build, you'll most definitely need a 16mm hole saw. And that's going to be to cut your hole, guys, in your motor levers, all right? Our motor levers are made from 10 millimeter thick flat steel, all right? They go over the shaft. So that 16 millimeter hole will slide over your motor shaft and it is inevitably welded to your motor shaft. We'll get to that on those uh, heavy duty industrial 180 watt wiper motors. Um, once again, I'll include a link in the description here to uh, when we do all of this sort of business and set them up on the brackets. Um, and there's a link in the description, guys, to source those motors. You need to find a motor in that ballpark with a 15 millimeter shaft, okay? You'll also require a 25 millimeter hole saw. That's what we're going to use right now to cut this hole into our mid frame to take our wiring. And you will need a 45 millimeter wood hole saw. So a hole saw for timber, 45 millimeter to drill your hole in your motor mount brackets to take all of this stuff when it's welded on to the motors. And that is all linked here now in the video to see how to set up the motor brackets so you know what I'm talking about. You'll see the hole saw being used to cut the, that timber decking. So there are some absolutely uh, needed items that you need to get to successfully do these elements of the build, okay? Right, so we're going to... Uh, 
cut this, guys. I'm going to cut this now with my hole saw on the floor, show you uh, that it indeed can be done. The beauty of us doing this now, nothing's on the mid-frame. So this is why we do this first and foremost, so we, we haven't got clunky bits welded onto the mid-frame. We can just sit this on the floor. It doesn't have to go all the way through the mid-frame. It's just the top face that we're drilling through. This is just to take our wires that we can feed through our mid-frame to the front of our mid-frame to our electronics controller box. Drill bits, guys, just normal twist bits. These are twist bits that can be used with metal or timber, but you're gonna need a set of uh, metal twist bits. This is a set, guys, that goes from one millimeter up to 13 millimeters. The little cordless drill I've got here, the battery drill I've got here, has a 13 millimeter chuck. You will need to get a drill, and uh, guys, I recommend just getting a corded drill. You don't need a battery drill, but make sure that that corded drill has a 13 millimeter chuck so it can take the larger drill bits. Now what we're gonna do guys, we're gonna pilot hole this hole first to make it easier on our hole saw drill bit, okay? So I'm gonna select a four millimeter drill bit and get it in my drill. Okay, this is just a hand tight drill bit and I'm gonna start with that. I'm gonna put this four millimeter hole into that mid frame first, then I'm gonna follow up with my hole saw. So this is one of the few scenarios guys where I would say you need to work on the ground for this because you can stand on your piece and it can't go anywhere. You can stand over your piece and look straight down. So then you keep a nice straight drill bit and then you can keep pressure on your drill bit. Couple of things, all right? Cutting metal here. We need slow speeds with metal cutting. We're not cutting timber. So make sure your drill is selected on its slowest speed possible. Get yourself a can a good old fashioned WD-40, for example. This is quite a decent uh, cutting fluid. You can buy real cutting fluid if you wish, but this will get the job done for the amount of cutting you're doing for this job. If you're gonna be working with metal every day, you would use a proper fluid set up with your drill press. But for this, guys, WD-40 is perfectly fine. All right, so where I've punched this, I'm gonna just put a little bit of WD-40 on to start with, like so. I'm going to stand on this. I find where I punched it so the drill sits in it and doesn't walk. And this is going to be a scenario where I try and have as much speed as I can without the drill bit stalling, but not over speed so that it's causing the drill bit to run too fast and get too hot because that will blunt your drill bit and then it's game over. You've either got to uh, resharpen your drill bit or go and buy another drill bit. So this is a speed controlled trigger on this one. So depending on your drill, I would recommend, as well as getting a 13 millimeter chuck, make sure you get a speed control off the trigger, all right? And there we go, guys, very quick because that's a small drill bit, right? A larger drill bit would take a lot longer to get through because you've got a much bigger face that has to chew through that metal, okay? But using smaller drill bits and stepping them up might seem like it's gonna take longer. It's actually much quicker. Uh, if I was using a big drill bit, like a 13 mil drill bit, for example, I would sometimes even do two pilot holes step up. I might do a four mil, a 10 mil, a 13 mil or a four mil, an eight mil and a 13 mil. That's the sort of scenario. Now let's select our hole saw. These are definitely gonna require you to have uh, a 13 millimeter chuck. Now the same deal guys, this time we've got a rather large surface here with our carbide teeth. So we want uh, cutting fluid, not all over the mid frame guys, because remember this is gonna be painted. We wanna try and keep oils off this as much as we can but we do need to have some fluid around this to pick up our carbide teeth, all right? Nice firm pressure with the foot. Okay, here we go. Now what I'll do while I'm cutting with this carbide saw, guys, is I'll do a slight oscillation, all right? So then it's cutting on all the surfaces and engaging all the teeth. All right, just slight, with slight pressure down way. Now 
Now what I'm going to do guys, I'm going to swap feet. I hope you can still see this. Because the drill is wanting to go this way, all right, when I'm cutting, because the, the drill is uh, working in a, in a clockwise motion, it's pushing the drill this way, right? I don't want that to cock, because when this goes through the metal, it's going to grab and cock. It can hurt my wrist, or I can risk snapping off my little pilot drill bit in the hole saw. So what I'll do is I'll bring my leg into play here, so my leg's going to keep my piece firm, I'm going to be able to lock the drill into my leg, all right? Right, a, a bit more fluid. And keep adding a little bit of fluid while you're going through, and you'll get a lot more life out of your drill bits or your hole saws. through there, I'm through on one part. So what I'm doing guys, I've actually cut through on some areas here, I can see through. Now it's time to, loot, to lighten up on the drill bit. Don't keep putting pressure on it. Lighten up and just a tiny little bit of pressure. All right, because otherwise it's gonna grab in those parts that it's already cut through and that's where you risk uh, chewing your teeth off. Your hole saw. So we'll start the hole saw before we engage and then bring it in nice and gentle. There we are. So you've just seen that if you just take your time, use some cutting fluid, know where to put pressure on, know where to back your pressure off, you can do it, all right? without any problems. Well, that is your lot for today. So until I see you in the next tutorial, you guys stay safe, stay healthy, and take it easy out there.